<laughs> Everybody hear me? Am I the only one with no Good. Person? All right, perfect. Uh, so my name is John Kidder. I am the Director of Information Operations Research at the Norwich University Applied Research Institute. Next to me is my colleague, Mark Perry, who is the lead researcher for the Peace and War Center here at Norwich University. Uh, going down the line, we've got Isabella Ross, Dumasani Jana, Lillian Liu, and Lucia Frezza. Uh, our panel today is gonna cover uh, a lot of student-led research um, that we've facilitated. And show of hands real quick, how many people out here know about the information warfare programming at Norwich University? Most everybody, all right, excellent. So myself and Mark have overseen the creation of uh, some of that content. Um, the information warfare minor, is everybody familiar with that? Show of hands, good, all right, I guess we don't have to explain that. Excellent. Um, so if anybody does have any questions about that or how to get into it, please feel free to reach out to myself or Mark and, uh, and or any of the students on this panel and they'll help uh, get you dialed in on that. So with that said, the information warfare experience here at Norwich uh, gives opportunities to students to do some very unique research in that field and take what they learned in the classroom into experiential learning where they actually get a research project and they get to research that and come up and um, kind of conclude their own findings and present that. Um, some of the research you'll see here today is very relevant with the events going on in the world and it is very beneficial for uh, these students leaving Norwich University to have that experience, but more importantly, the students have done that research because in a lot of institutions that you're gonna um, see in, in your life, uh, this topic is very vague with a lot of people and a lot of people don't understand it. Um, and as, as a result, they don't research it. So you don't know what you don't know. And when information is weaponized and used, as was seen in the previous uh, briefing, it, it's a very powerful tool and it's the preferred tool of most of our adversaries right now. So it's very important to understand. Uh, with that said, uh, Mark's gonna talk a little bit about our information warfare lab that we do. Mark? Yep. Sure, so as John said, we have a uh, first in the nation undergraduate minor in information warfare, which we're very proud of. It's our second year. We've already graduated our first uh, students with that as a minor. Open to all majors, right? So we embrace the whole diversity of this, this problem set. In addition, like John mentioned, um, you know, I, I think someone before lunch mentioned that we're, we're, we're in this moment now as a nation where uh, we're still sort of figuring out what, uh, how to build capacity in, in information warfare and respond to this problem set. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about that at Norwich in the classroom, as John mentioned, but also through practical experiences. Um, and the centerpiece of that practical component here in Norwich is this information warfare research lab, which goes on every summer. Um, we've been doing this for three years now. It's a 12-week immersive program. We usually have around 15 students who get trained up uh, on, o on OSINT uh, analysis and uh, attribution, uh, focused specifically on attributing and assessing uh, foreign malign influence. Um, the first summer in 2022 was uh, exclusively focused on uh, analyzing Russian influence in Ukraine and around that conflict. And this past summer, we took a big step forward uh, by uh, assessing both Russian and Chinese influence uh, in Africa. In total, uh, the interns here covered 19 different countries uh, and produced 1,500 pages of digital threat reports. So we find that very impressive uh, and a great place to keep building capacity. Um, and without further ado, uh, we have two of those interns here on the panel today. You'll hear from a little bit of their kind of key takeaways from the summer researching China and Russia and Africa. And then we have two of our Schultz fellows um, focusing on, on information warfare. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first student speaker here. Uh, Lucia Frezza is a senior from Wintersville, Ohio, studying computer science, uh, sorry, computer security and information assurance with a concentration in digital forensics and a minor in German. As a Cypher fellow and a member of CLDP, she's involved in campus cybersecurity events, outreach and research. Her research focuses on the threat profile of cyber actors and how they use perception. Uh, in her spare time, which is hobbies include uh, rock climbing, horseback riding, and drinking coffee. So we'd like to hear from Lucia and hear some of her great cutting edge research in this space. Thank you, Mark. All right. 
Alrighty, while that loads up. Um, hello, my name is Lucia Frezza. Um, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. I'm a senior here at Norwich studying computer security information assurance. And today I'm talking about Anonymous Sedan, the cyber threat actor turned social media influencer. Basically, how this independent cyber threat actor group leverages perception in its cyber operations against Israel. So most importantly is understanding this intersection between influence and cyber warfare. warfare. As I'm sure most of you are aware, there's this big intersection between kinetic conflict and the use of perception and influence war warfare. But with cyber on the rise, cyber attacks and technical operations are becoming more and more of a huge role in these kinetic com conflicts and confrontations. And so understanding how cyber effects can influence a conflict and how the perception of these cyber attacks can play a role in conflict is really important. Alrighty, getting into the most important part. Who is Anonymous Sedan? Um, also known as Storm 1359, Anonymous Sedan is an independent cyber threat actor. An independent cyber threat actor is basically a cyber threat actor that is not associated with a state government particularly. So they have to manage their own finances, create their own sources and malware and software. And they oftentimes behave a little erratically. Um, for example, Anonymous Sedan likes to post things like, who's ready, and bruh. Um, they are also known for working with other cyber cr criminals, such as Kilnet, a Russian hacktivist group. Um, and they have a variety of technical operations that they can do. So Anonymous Sedan is most known for their DDoS, which is de distributed denial of service. Um, Basically, a distributed denial of service attack is when an attacker uses a botnet or several hacked machines in order to overwhelm a victim with traffic. This stops legitimate traffic. It can shut down businesses. For example, a service can only receive so much information at one time. A DDoS would basically effectively, excuse me, shut down all communi legitimate communication to that victim. Now, as mentioned previously, they have to deal with their own finances, and Anonymous Sedan does this in a way that's not like other hacktivists or hacker groups like themselves. They sell their services. Basically, they ran it as a business, a DDoS as a service kind of deal. So they use this thing called InfraShutdown, which is a software, and it is basically a DDoS package that they sell and run for customers. They also use it as an exclusive offering. As you can see on the right-hand side, they are basically asking for customers to show proof that they can actually purchase their wares and their services. So most importantly, I think it's important to talk about the targets. So as with any group, they will target the US, Kenya, UK, Israel, things that are against or for their cause but also the industries. Now, most hacktivist groups, a hacktivist is a group that does something for a cause, hacks someone for a cause, is looking at who they target. Most hacktivists will target things like news sources and disinformation campaigns, what they deem as disinformation. But also, anonymous Havana is a bit strange because they'll target you know, miscellaneous groups such as KFC and Cloudflare, but academia and you know, universities both in Israel, in this case, and outside of Israel. But most importantly, they also target critical infrastructure, which is usually the job of the state-based threat actor. They'll target oil, telecommunications, the electric grid. And this is, has huge effects in conflict. Now, most, so they use social media, specifically Telegram, which is a social media source, to influence their readers and people to try to garner them towards their cause. For example, they often will post about their attacks, be like, this is successful, this is why we attack them, and things like that. They will use word choice, diction, sentiment to try to influence people reading their posts towards their ideals, their causes, their reasons behind doing things. So, for example, in the bottom, you'll see they say, glory to the Palestinian resistance, we are with you. They're using strong word choices 
to be like pro-Palestinian views, pro-Russian views, which is very interesting considering the groups from Sudan. But they also work with many other cyber criminals. As mentioned before, they work with Killnet, and they often work with these other cyber criminals to better their works. Um, they'll, they'll borrow software and skills and people. As you'll notice in the top left corner, a lot of the people on this inner circle of them actually aren't you know, just random people. They're other bots, and it's Killnet, and it's gonna be the other cybersecurity, uh, cyber criminals, excuse me, like We Red Evils, uh, Wilford CEO, SAFGov. Um, and in the bottom, it actually talks about an attack that they worked with a group called Siege Sec on to attack the global navigational satellite system of Israel. So overall, this makes up their workflow. They start out with a technical attack. They publicize the successful attack, usually going two hours in, three hours in, giving updates. But then they'll also outsource. They'll post links and posts, anything from a credible source to improve their legitimacy. So then they can take that, follow up with another post going, hey, look, we're credible, we're legitimate, we're important. You should think about what we think about. Now, for example, this is how they use it in action. So in February, Anonymous Sedan attacked two UK universities for their support, for the UK support of Israel, um, the University of Cambridge and the University of Manchester. They posted about this saying, we, we attacked these two big universities. It was successful. The BBC followed up with an article saying, hey, these two universities were attacked. Their systems were down for about a day. Things are well and good now. Anonymous Sedan immediately followed up with a new presentation, a new post, going, hey, look, the BBC posted this. It had an effect, tangible effect. We did something. This was important. You should buy into our views. Now, this can have a lot of implications in conflict and also in the real world. Most importantly, though, I think, is the cyber in conflict, but how independent cyber threat actors play a part in that. They're usually more erratic, more chaotic. You can't really predict where they're going to attack or what technical wonder they're going to try to come up with next. But at the same time, it's important to kind of find where a lot of these groups' motivations are coming from, maybe shut down their social media accounts, and try to create mitigations that will stop most of these attacks. Because you can stop the state-based threat actors that you know are coming, but can you always stop those you don't know exist? Um, and so this is important in how they control their influence because they can control the perception of conflict by trying to prove that one side is better or more effective than the other, even though they're not directly involved in that conflict. Their country is not directly there, not directly involved. So basically, we went over who is Anonymous Sedan, their technical operations, how they use Telegram and social media to prove their points, their overall workflow, and why this might be important. Um, my email's down at the bottom of the screen, and if you have any questions um, at the end, and a couple works referenced, thank you so much. Thank you, Lucia. And yes, we will, um, if, if I could ask the audience, please to note down your questions for any individual presenters, and we can get to them at the end of the panel. Um, our next presenter is Lillian Liu. Uh, she is a junior from Tucson, Arizona, pursuing studies in the 4 plus 1 Accelerated Master's Program in Computer Security and Information Assurance with a concentration in digital forensics. Uh, she's also minoring in Chinese Information Warfare, History, and Naval Studies. Uh, on campus, Lillian is actively involved in several activities, including the Corps of Cadets, CDLP, or CLDP, Women's Rugby, uh, and the Campus Newspaper. She's also working towards uh, an Army intelligence contract with aspirations to serve in a three-letter agency. Uh, Lillian? All righty, thank you, Mark. All right. 
So in allude to the topic of this year for the military symposium, Perception War is the Battle of Control of Reality, my case study is specifically going to be concerning on Israel's military use of AI in the current Israel and Hamas conflict. I'll be examining the media options and outlets that is going to be shaping perception battles. Okay, so what is going on today? So the military implementation of AI is known as autonomous weapon systems, and this is specifically spoken about in RAIM 2023 in February, where uh, 47 parties and nations have gathered to discuss the international use of the development, deployment, and the military use of AI. And among the 47 attending states, Israel was not a member. Um, what autonomous weapon systems is exactly is can be categorized as an artificial agent designed at minimum to be able to change its own international states to, to achieve a given goal. So whether that is to be able to identify, select, attack, a certain specified target. And this is usually done with or without the intervention of an agent and is deployed to exert kinetic and force against a physical entity. So this is usually a object or a human being. However, just as it is newly spoken about in RAIN 2023, military ap application of AI is still a very new topic. It is considered to be emerging technology and that the community itself is still trying to figure out um, the ethics and the standards in which it, we can hold it to. Okay. To be able to conduct my research, I utilize two different methods. First being open source intelligent, meaning everything that I'm gonna to present to you today is on the World Wide Web. The second is gonna be Google Dorking. This is known to be an advanced search option that is gonna comb the web depending on the keywords that I utilize for the engine search. And it's gonna comb for specific keywords to find the information I need. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the technology and the AI system that Israel is using is actively being used in the current war and conflict, uh, the way the media is portraying such information is a little more difficult to get a hold of. I've additionally utilized VPN, virtual network protection, that assists in redirecting my location to help bypass the censorship and gain access to region-specific articles. So articles that I could gain access to if I was, my location was directed to the United States would not be as visible or viable if my location was set to the Netherlands or, one, or Japan, per se. So the first AI algorithm used by Israel is known and called Lavender. This AI system is used to support Israel's mission in Israel's Hamas conflict, that is to ultimately um, eradicate Hamas as an organization, but the algorithm identifies individuals as targets based off their association with Hamas in a PIJ, that is the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The database processes raw surveillance data gathered from uh, social media connections, familial ties, and other behavior patterns based off a specified criteria to generate what Israel call as a kill list. Uh, before Lavender's deployment, the target selection was a complex process designed to ensure that the targets were originally high levels of the military. However, after the Hamas surprise attack on October 7th, 2023, the criteria was set to systemize the detection of all military operatives, regardless of their rank. So one of the biggest things that um, AI involves is on how much or how little of human input is gonna be implemented. And one uh, that was said for Lavender is that a human operative after it gains intelligence will gain about 20 seconds on each target before it's set to uh, the next level. So this 20 seconds is used to determine whether or not the target is a male or female. If it was a female, the target would be removed and would not be considered any longer. However, if it's a male, because there is in the military Hamas organization, only male, male members are part of the military itself. So the second um, AI algorithm that Israel utilizes is called Where is Daddy? Ironic to its name, it gathers, it, it collaborates with Lavender to take the identified targets from the kill list and gathers data to track their traffic patterns. 
Repetition has shown a trend where targets are systematically bombed at night when family members are present. And according to Plus 972, a English version of local Cal, Israel's largest social media outlet, um, it was due to because it was large, easier to locate the individuals in private housing than per se in a traveling vehicle. So the third um, AI algorithm used is what Israel called Habasura, or AKA the gospel. This AI algorithm takes the information gathered from the first two initial algorithms, and it's gonna be used to identify airstrike targets, specifically individual operators in military equipment like rocket launchers or military bases and medical centers. So it, the gospel won the Innovation Award in 2020, and it's acknowledged by the IDF um, as a prone offensive method of locating Hamas operatives. And however, the specific identification method remains classified, it is likely to have retrieved text messages, its data from text messages, satellite imagery, and drone footages. So in conclusion of these three algorithms, based off of the data that it gathers and concludes in, it's gonna be automatically sent to an application called the Pillar of Fire that is automatically installed to military issue smartphones carried by commanders. This is gonna allow them to have an automatic and fast um, input and conclusion on whether or not an air, airstrike should be issued and whether or not the target itself, um, target itself should be uh, launch at all. So it is important to note here that news outlets based in Gaza are facing significant challenges in, repeating, in reporting about the ongoing war and blockade due to um, regional media op operations. And much instead of much of the reports uh, about the situation in Gaza, often comes from international media organization or the Palestinian journalists working with. Uh, foreign outlets, which therefore a lot of the information gathered through open source intelligence was more Israel biased due to the open publication of Israel's news media and the censorship that Gaza is facing at this moment. Okay, so in conclusion, with AI continuously improving to redefine its field of use, a strategic aspect is no exception. Tal Miram lecture at Lecturer at Hebrew University in Jerusalem with experience with Israeli's military targeting operations states, what used to take 20 intel officers to produce 500 to 100 targets in one year, the gospel itself and its associated algorithms can suggest about 200 targets within 10 to 12 days. This means that the military incorporation of AI has significantly cut down the amount of time in the decision making progress. Um, artificial intelligence itself is not inherently good or bad, but the way we apply it is gonna dictate the light in which it's gonna be perceived. And that is why the media outlets, analyzing the media outlets is significantly important here because based off of what the targeted audience is gonna see, it's also gonna be how they're gonna view AI in its military applications. So I wish to touch one more upon RIM 2023 that hosted 24 attending states on its international consensus on the development and the deployment and the use of AI because, the, because this is such a new emerging technology, the ethics and the standards in which we can put AI to is still unknown at this moment. But however, the United States themselves after this uh, conference period, they, they published a document called Political Declaration of the Responsible Military Use of AI and Autonomy, and it's gonna be a guide for the country to on the development, deployment, and the use of AI technologies specifically for defensive purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. We have one more student's presentation here. Um, these two students were two of the um, around 15 student intern analysts who worked with us in the Summer Information Warfare Research Lab, and they're gonna to touch briefly on some of their experiences and key takeaways from that. Um, we have Dumisana Janda. Uh, he is an international student from Zimbabwe studying electrical and computer engineering. With a strong interest in technology and problem solving, Dumisani 
has been involved in several activities such as threat casting, information warfare internships, OSINT programs, and the AWS annual challenge. He is skilled in various programming languages and design software. Secondly, we have Isabella Ross. Um, she is an, a senior at Norwich University from North Carolina. She's working towards earning a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice, a Bachelor of Science in Criminology, uh, three minors in political science, transnational crime and information warfare, and a concentration in emergency management. She's been an IW intern with us at Norwich University Applied Research Institutes for the past year and a half where she's focused her efforts on researching conflict overseas and malign influence campaigns. When she graduates college, Isabella uh, has a goal to serve in federal law enforcement and she's currently earning an experience as an intern with Homeland Security Investigations. So thank you, we'll hear from both of you guys now. Alrighty, good afternoon everybody. Um, so today, as Mark stated, uh, Dum Sani and I are gonna be going over our research from the past summer. Um, I'd like to note, like he said, there were more of us. There are a couple fellow interns sitting in the audience as well, so I wanna send you guys my thanks as well, because you guys put in a lot of hard work with this as well. So to start off, we focused mainly on West Africa. We moved into a little bit of Central Africa as well. One thing to point out is the demographics of the area. So there's hundreds of spoken languages from English, French, to Portuguese because of the colonization of these uh, countries. They've begun to move away from some of these um, languages as well, just how the political influence has moved so far. For religion, there's a lot of Islam and Christianity as those are the two main uh, religions in the area. The political atmosphere ranges from stable uh, governments excuse me, to nations with histories of coups. A lot of the countries tend to have military coups that take place, some of which do have influence from our adversaries as well. There's also military involvement, so that goes along with the coups, which we saw with Russia having involvement in some coups as well. Pro poverty, corruption, political instability, and security threats remain a major issue for many of the Western African countries, and our adversaries are finding those issues and providing solutions, which cause, causes a threat for us as a nation. When it comes to communication, uh, radio is the most commonly found that we've found so far. There's not a lot of internet out there like we have here in the United States, so one thing they use is radio because it has a wider broadcast it can go from urban areas to rural areas to provide information whether it's true or not. Media censorship and controlled information environments are a common theme, especially in conflict-prone areas. There's an increase in urban migration to major cities, i.e. Lagos, Accra, Dakar. Uh, rural areas still remain the central population for majority of the countries. However, we are seeing a general shift towards the urbanization of the central cities in these countries. Finally, economics, uh, economies excuse me, range from oil-rich nations to Nigeria to economies like Burkina Faso and Mali. So when it comes to the methodology that we used as interns, first we received what we needed to look at. That was from both John and Mark. So we received what we were supposed to look at as a general area and then specific influence actors. For this past summer, we specifically focused on China and Russia. I know the summer before, when we were doing our individual research, it was more Russian focused. From there, then we received collection guidance, so they presided, pr provided excuse me, the tools on how to collect the information that we will further see in the steps. Second was defining the area of research. So even though we were provided West Africa as a whole, it was then broken down into three central um, specific areas. My team, including Dumasani, we focused on section two. Um, we had section one and section three focus more on coastal areas and then more inland as well. Then we found areas of interest, which would include major cities, 
but also looking at the rural areas that I was talking about earlier because a lot of the rural areas include the farmers who receive the communication, especially if they don't go into those cities. Next was analyzing the information environment. This included the idea of creating a country report. So when we received the first country, I can't remember off the top of my head which one we did first, but which one? It was Senegal, excuse me. So we focused on Senegal first and we did a deep dive into their background because how can you research something that you know nothing about? So we looked at the information environment, what sort of technologies they had, what their economy looks like, military, and political landscape. These aspects opened the doors to what specific areas of influence we should be looking at. Next was identifying the PRC and Russian malign influence. So this was doing the open source intelligence that Lillian was talking about. We had tools such as OSINT techniques, OSINT intel, and then we also, a couple of us received a textbook that we could go through for tools as well. Um, because some of these domains were online, whether Chinese or Russian, we used a source that would place our IP address in a different location to protect our individual machines and ourselves and in information. Next was then analyzing the PRC and Russian influence ecosystem. Once we did the data collection, we then had to actually understand what we were seeing. And I'll have an example of this on the next slide. But seeing the connections that Russia wasn't just doing Russian stuff, China wasn't just focusing on China, there were links together between the two, which is called convergence. Oh, there it goes. Finally, with all of this information, one thing that Mark brought up was we compiled a report that was 1,500 pages across all of the interns. This report included a massive dime report for the national pillars of um, influence, excuse me. It included all of our threat reports on the domain analysis. We also did threat reports on companies and specific individuals. Some of them were CEOs or political, um, political actors that did have connections to the PRC or Russia. So this is just one example of a country map that I created with my team. So it's a little bit, I know it's a little bit hard to see in the back with the select icons, but all of the orange are companies that we found are connected to domains that we researched, and then we would link them back to their respective malign uh, country, excuse me. This one is a little bit difficult compared to some of the other ones that I've created, but on the very far right, you'll see the Russian influence, and then everything on the left is majority of Chinese influence. So you can see, this was for Guinea, uh, the country of Guinea. You can see that China has a lot more influence in Guinea than Russia does. But that could also mean that Russia's more discreet with what they're doing. So that's where we step in and try to find those links as much as we can with the open source intelligence tools that we have available. And then what we have here is an example of one of the domains that we went through. This one was particularly interesting because we see, um, we see different uh, information compared to what we were consistently seeing with domains. We found a, an individual who is the founder of this domain who had political influence within Guinea and also seems to be posted across several different pro-China posting um, content domains. So this domain particularly, as you can see in the article, to the uh, left-hand side, posts pro-China content mainly, and this was an extract from less than 30 days ago. So this shows that they are consistently posting pro-China content and it's up to date. So the way we attribute the threat levels to these domains is that we split it into three different sections. First being behavioral, the second being contextual, and the third being technical. Contextual being what do they post on their domain? That is what we see the article there. And what is the context of that information? Are they supporting China or are they against China? Are they supporting Russia or are they against Russia? That is the contextual evidence. The behavioral evidence would be how often, how often do they post this information? How many followers do they have on their social media? How many people view this, these pages on a daily basis? That would, be, that would fall under the behavioral evidence. And then under the technical evidence, which is where we usually struggle a little bit because of 
the, uh, because of the covert and gray nature of these domains is that that's where we find the ownership of the domain and uh, where its servers are located and when it was created and how long it has been up and running, if there have been any other past versions of the same domain. We do a lot of research into the technical aspect of the domain itself to try and find the connections, as Isabella showed before, to other companies and to other threat actors as well. And then for strategic objectives, what we do is we use this acronym, DIAM, which, is which makes use of diplomacy, information, military, and economic standpoints for each threat actor. And we, divide, we divided this uh, between China and Russia and tried to see if there were any similarities or differences between the way they approach the influence that they have in these regions. The first being diplomacy. We noticed that China has, both China and Russia have very strong diplomatic relations with this region and in several countries as well. We noticed that the information structure and the uh, spread of information is very high and uh, there's increased infrastructural development from China to support this information spread. We realized that um, in Senegal, China is actually funding um, the development of uh, cell towers, cellular towers using one of their companies Huawei to build these cell towers and provide internet access to all of these people. And you can, your guess is as strong as mine what they're going to be sending on these cell towers. The next thing is military involvement. We saw a lot more military involvement from Russia than we did from China. China basically seems to veer towards providing economic and um, health aid, and then Russia is inclined more towards um, the military aspect of these regions and looking to countries that are, coup, that are prone to coups and also prone to military involvement in politics. We also see the economic, the economic um, objectives that these two threat actors have. Firstly, China maximizing the trade posts and uh, ports within these countries, especially the ones along the coast. We also notice that there's a lot of strong economic development that's also starting to come out from Russia providing power solutions as well to these areas because they do not have access to electricity in all areas of these regions. And we also noticed that there's a lot of educational benefits that these two threat actors provide for these countries. So we see a lot of scholarships for young children to study both in China and Russia. We see a lot of language exchange as well between the, um, between the countries and the, the local regions. And at the end of our internship, we sat together and tried to, dis to discuss and figure out what possible solutions could we come up with. The first we came up with was an increase in education and awareness of misinformation and disinformation. Because in this region there's a low literacy rate, it's very common for people to fall prey to disinformation and misinformation, which is why it is easy for them to spread propaganda in these areas. So increasing the education of this threat to the individuals who are prone to this allows them to be able to defend themselves and avoid all of the propaganda that is in their area. The second being if aid is a common reason for infiltration, providing the means for self-sustaining and growing economies would be a long-term so solution. So because a lot of these areas are in need of basic commodities, if they are provided with a way to provide themselves with these commodities, then they will not be falling prey to, to these traps that are set for them. The last being assisting in creating an environment where the population truly understands and somewhat has a say in the development of the country. So coming from a third world country as well, I've experienced this firsthand, seeing how most of the population really does not understand what the political standpoint is in the country. And a lot of it is being controlled by unseen actors. And because the people do not understand when the time for democracy to vote comes, they really don't know who exactly to vote for and what to vote for and what it means to vote. So giving that level of, um, giving that level of education within that aspect will help immensely with um, solving these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will do a couple short
panel questions, and if people want to queue up for audience questions, uh, we can move to that next. My question for the panel uh, would be, given what we discussed before lunch as well with the various challenges facing researchers in this area, um, I wonder what sort of challenges you guys encountered researching information warfare subject matter. So I think one of the biggest challenges that I faced was hitting some of the paywalls and firewalls. Uh, when we're doing the open source intelligence, some of the sites and domains that we're researching don't want people to know what's on there unless you're paying for it. Um, this can be both U.S. sources, but also European and African sources that have these paywalls. Um, other than that, I think that the toolbox that we were provided did give a great benefit to us because, I mean, we found 1,500 pages worth of information, which is incredible. Um, but I'd say mainly the, the firewalls and the private servers and the paywalls. Um. Another thing that we noticed that we had a few problems with was being able to access radio stations because in this region, in the regions we were working with, a lot of the information was spread through radio stations. So having software that would be able to give us um, speech, uh, speech to text information that we can go through in real time was a big challenge for us. So that was, that was I think, another main issue we had. Oh, one of the bigger challenges I had was analyzing media outlets in real time. So when I first started my research back in June, a lot of the information on the web wasn't as viable as it is today, uh, just due from the time difference from and how long we were into that conflict. And uh, finding, being able to find terms and airstrikes and about anything about the AI algorithm itself was a lot more difficult to find because none of Israel's media options per se have directly linked it back directly to the algorithm itself. And so instead of what I had to do was go through an indirect way of searching through key terms like airstrike, Hamas, uh, conflicts, and trying to match the time and with the technology being used. Going off of that idea of time, um, I think influence operations is hard because while there are tangible outcomes, it's hard to quantify them and it's hard to see how that is happening in real time as you know the smallest experiences change how something happens. And so it's, it was hard to find ways to quantify the information that we were getting, the tangible effects of what people were saying and uh, like what posts, what the effects actually were on people reading them. All right, so first, thank you all for your time and effort that you put into these projects. Uh, my question to you is reflecting back on this experience, what advantages has this equipped you with over your peers that you run into on a daily basis or any time you go home that might go to other academic institutions? So I think my background kind of helped first with setting me apart. Um, I'm not the same background as Dumi, but my mother was in a country, or she was raised in a country where the USSR was heavily involved. So she had that background. So I started having those conversations with her growing up and taking that experience and really setting forth how it impacted this internship and my understanding, I think sets me apart because I already had a little bit of understanding regarding how Russia interacts and acts as an outside source and then taking that and applying it to the research really just boosted my understanding. But then doing a further deep dive, I now watch the news differently. Um, I view stuff and I take sources with a grain of salt. I will do extra research on top of seeing just headlines. And then having those conversations with my peers is something interesting because it's scientifically known that a lot of people tend to just focus on the titles of articles and not do the research. So having those conversations and trying to educate my peers, but also educate high school students when they come on campus, I think that really helps me set, set myself apart. Uh, for me, I think my biggest thing was getting over, getting over my bias, my biases. Uh, growing up, a lot of the companies and radio stations and stuff that I got to see during the internship 
it was an eye opener to see that oh there's actually connections to China there's connections to Russia there but these were main sources of information spread like throughout the country so being able to see that and experience it firsthand the other side of the same story it was it was an eye opener for me and getting to experience that is is a game changer as well so that's that's something that definitely I, I think sets me apart from my peers and I think even other interns of the program who are also African students or international students can say the same thing and testify that it's, it's, it really is an eye opener getting to see and experience the same type of information but from the other side where you get to see where it's originating from and who is, who is benefiting from this information being spread. <clears throat> So in addition to being a cyber uh, major, um, I believe that my experience this summer with the use of stock internship has led me to um, guide my research a little bit more. So this summer, I was attached to the eighth psychological operation group, where among them, I was able to interact and gain experience on how to generalize my media, especially the research added on. Uh, a lot of the, my mentors from that group helped me with being able to analyze and focus that bias away from how the technology is um, being persuaded, or sorry, being perceived by the media source, and focus on the facts rather than looking at the specifics on how it's being influencing it, the country itself. So I think coming from a cyber background, a technical cyber background, cyber and warfare is something that's becoming an up and coming topic. Everybody wants to know how countries might use it in conflict and to gain advantages. And so I think it's, it was really interesting for me to learn about how independent cyber threat actors play into that field, but also why it's important that we don't just discredit them because they don't have the same background or funding that a state-based actor could have. And like the technical operations that some of these actors can do is just fairly interesting. See, we have about a minute or two left here. Um, if there is an audience question, we might have time for one. If anyone has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, please, on, on the right. Go for it. Oh, OK. Back to the very, left. Very polite. Um, my name is Edward Cahill. I was wondering, for all of you, how did language differences and maybe issues with different sources being in different languages affect your research? I'm sorry, the question was, how did language differences affect what? Uh, your research, like finding sources and sources being in separate languages. I'll go first, Dan. Um, so I think one thing that was really interesting for us when we were researching some of the Russian stuff is some of the domains will have English versions, same with the Chinese as well, but they'll have English versions and then they'll have Russian versions. So if you look on the English side, it's completely different. So their headlines, their content, everything's completely different. But once you hit the Russian tab and then just Google Translate or whatever translator you have attached to your machine, um, <coughs> excuse me, it will show you what's actually being said. And having a comparison of the two is, to me, it's fairly interesting because it shows you what the Russian population, or at least those speaking and from the diaspora, have that background and what they're seeing versus what's being pushed to the other countries. So for me, it's seeing that balance between the two. Um, for me, when I was looking into Israel's media per options per se, a lot of the me originally media from Israel, they had an English version of the news that they're publishing. And what not pointed, got noticed by me was what the articles that were published on the English version was significantly different or even not available on the Israel original media portion, meaning that the targeted audience that's in the Israel version of the media is being guided in a different perception than the English version where there's more of a different audience that can speak English. I'm gonna move to the last question here. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I was just curious about, because the third group, the last group there, mentioned that the Chinese were um, pushing the use of their own ISPs and internet service providers into um, 
West Africa and stuff like that. Are you guys seeing correlations with them trying to use this to gain control and leverage over the spread of information over in Africa, similar to how they control information spread over in China? Or is that a domain that they can't access? So what we realized also, as we mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, was we see a lot of information censorship in these regions by the government. So if we do have situations where China is controlling the information, it will be through the state, through the, the local state media. And the way they do that is because they've put in these investments in the infrastructure, they do have control, somewhat a, a level of control of this infrastructure and the internet per se. So yes, we do, we, we did realize that there was a lot of censorship and because of that censorship, they were they were cutting out we we also couldn't get access to some domains and we noticed at some point there was a domain that we had access to at the beginning of the summer and halfway through it was it was just gone so it's situations like that where you can see that there's there's active involvement that's there and there's a possibility that china does have a hand in terms of censorship and my side as well was the journalism so we found, I know that Dumi found this heavily at one point, there's a lot of journalism programs where journalism, journalists excuse me, from Africa will go to China to train and then they'll come back with already those influences happening and then they'll start pushing that in their own media. So it's not just, oh, we're gonna push information to the country, it's we're gonna train your people to think this way and then proceed to push it out that way too. So that was another trend we found. Well, thank you very much for the questions, and thanks again for our four panelists here. Fantastic research, and I encourage anyone with you know more detailed down in the weeds questions to come up uh, afterwards and, and speak to our panelists. Thanks. Thank you.